Hello there, and welcome to Gravity Tonic. I'm Nick, and today I want to talk about, about the randomization group, which is something I worked with during my master's degree. And I've studied about it before, and I've studied about it after. And I think it is one of the most interesting and complex themes in physics, and are very rarely found in scientific communication. So I find it really interesting to talk about it here, because, well, you can't really find much on anywhere else, except for very specific uh, books and, and etc. Within science communication, I mean, it is really widely used in physics, just not talk about so much. The only reference that I know that talks about the, the randomization group within a psychom level is Lost in Math by Zabine Hossenfelder. I'm not really sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but uh, I'll leave a link to the book in the description, anyway. <laughs> and I wanted to talk a little about, about it, a little bit about it. <laughs> you see, uh, in physics, you often deal with many different scales. We, when we're doing quantum mechanics, when we're doing quantum stuff, we're dealing with very little things. We are dealing with atoms, we are dealing with molecules. Often we are dealing with even smaller things, such as nuclei or particles, elementary particles, and so on and so forth. However, on everyday physics, we're dealing with everyday things. So we're dealing with trees, we're dealing with cars, we're dealing with people, we're dealing with balls, we're dealing with a deck of cars, we're dealing with how exactly they behave among themselves. So we wonder, for example, how can I go from particles and molecules to being able to, to take a deck of cards and actually do this with them without a great lapse in our knowledge. So how do we go from one theory to another, from one scale to the other? And we do that in a sort of natural way. For example, take water. We know water in small details it is made of, of atoms. These atoms are molecules, which are H2O, uh, which have molecule behaviors and so on. And eventually, if you group a lot of molecules together, you get a droplet. But if you get a lot of droplets together, you get a glass of water. But if you get a lot of glass of water together, or glasses of water <laughs> together, you eventually get the ocean. And each of these things behaves in completely different manners. So if I put a glass, if, if I put a droplet of water on the wall, it is going to stay there and just slide a little bit. If I put a glass of water on the wall, my mom's gonna shout at me. Because <laughs> that is not going to behave in the same way. That is way too much water to hold to the wall. And the ocean is an even more difficult thing for you to imagine how exactly to get there. It is difficult to understand how physics can describe all of these things in different scales, in so different ways, uh, despite being the same thing, despite all of them being water. How exactly is water so different among each different scale? And the randomization group has everything to do with that, albeit in a very more, in a much more specific context, which is that of quantum field theories and statistical field theories. So when you're dealing with a quantum field theory, you 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 often have this true field theory, this true theory that underlies everything, and we know nothing about it because well, physics is done from our scale to the more fundamental scales at smaller sizes. Uh, and larger energies. But at our scale, at our human scale, we start from here and try to go to smaller scales, try to heat uh, smaller things together and see what comes out and stuff like that. So we try to go in that direction. However, there is some description, there is some physics, there is something going on in a very small scale. So we'll take, for example, the standard model. So we start with the standard model of particle physics at some scale, the electric scale, for example, which is where we are usually interested in. However, if you try to go to uh, to larger scales, to other scales, you might get to other interesting phenomena. For example, the beta decay, which is essentially when a nuclei, when nuclei, when a nucleus emits an electron, and due to some internal processes going there. I'm not really a nuclear physicist, so I'm not going to try to talk too much about it, although it is really important in the history of quantum field theory. It was the first time someone thought about creating an electron. It was due to Fermi 
and it is a brilliant idea. He was the first one to get it. Anyway, um, so you have this thing, the, the beta decay, and Fermi knew nothing about the, st the, the standard model, so he did not start by using the standard model. The standard model will be discovered um, 30 years later in the 60s while Fermi was doing this in the 30s. That's how huge it was. <laughs> and what Fermi did was, instead of getting the, fund the fundamental theory, the standard model, which is what we know nowadays, and there are more fundamental theories we are searching for, what Fermi did was to make an effective theory. So instead he said, okay, if I... Um, annihilate these particles in the nucleus and I create an electron here and there and do this sort of process, then I think I can describe what is happening. And he could. He could actually describe that. I just gave a, a qualitative description, but that gets a quantitative description. You can get numbers out of it and match experiments using this thing, these sorts of things. But it is very different from the standard model. It is very different from the fundamental description. What Fermi did was, okay, so two particles came out so two particles come in, they sort of disappear, and two particles come out, which are going to be an electron and a nine-time neutrino. And through this process, you get what is called beta decay, and the particles that are coming in and out are actually um, neutrons and protons. You're going to have one turning into the other, stuff like that. Let me okay. Let me be a little bit more serious and say what exactly the process is. So you're going to have a neutron come in, and this neutron that is in your nucleus will decay into a proton, which has smaller mass, by emitting an electron and an antineutrino. That is the process. That is beta decay. Okay. Think you could have just thought that in the beginning, instead of just keeping fooling around until you eventually need it. Anyway, you have that. That is beta decay. And this was his description of it. The neutron comes in, the three particles come out, nothing more. And this is not what happens in the standard model. What happens in the standard model is a much different thing in which you're going to have your neutron coming in and you're going to have, let me check, huh, I gotta think a little bit, you're gonna have your proton coming out and a W boson coming out and this W boson eventually fades into an electron and an antineutrino. What I'm saying is not exactly what the standard model says. The standard model says that about quarks going into electrons and neutrinos but quarks comprise neutrons and protons, so I'm being a little bit sketchy in here, but the main idea is that. So the standard model adds in a new particle, the W boson, that intermediates all of this action. So instead of having four particles interacting at once, which is one particle turning into three, you have one particle turning into two, and then one of these two in turning into two more. So you have an extra step. And the idea in here is why exactly do they match? Why can we use both the standard model and the Fermi theory to make predictions for uh, the, the beta decay, at least at some energies? And the reason is because physics is, you matter. it doesn't matter whether you like it or not, an experimental science. So when you're doing physics, what matters is the experiment. And if your experimental apparatus isn't sensitive enough to the details you want to, to describe in theory, well, then the details of the theory simply doesn't matter. If you're doing an experiment that doesn't need the details of the standard model, you can just as well use Fermi's theory, which is easier, to get very good predictions that will match your experiment. It's the same reason why we don't use general relativity to build buildings, because gravity on Earth is not really that large. So we don't really need to matter so much about the tiny details that GR would correct to the Earth gravity. In fact, we often don't even need to consider Newtonian gravity. It suffices for you to consider a constant gravity field, and that will do just as well as long as you're close to, to the surface of the Earth. If you're too far away, then you need to take other corrections. But this is the main idea. Depending on your experiments, depending on your apparatus, depending on how well it measures things, you may use one thing or the other. And we can recover this lower energy theories from the higher energy ones. But the thing is, when you start from the standard model, that one is the more fundamental theory. That one works for more things. It works for more things than the, Feynman, than the, than the Fermi interactions work for. However, this should also mean that you should be able to recover the Fermi interaction from the standard model. And you can, what you do is we call integrating out the W boson. 
So you're going to consider all the effects of the Debye boson in your theory in advance, and then you're going to get a remaining theory which has the interactions of the W boson encoded within it. So it's similar to how you start with water and the properties of the molecules, the way they interact, eventually lead to large phenomena. So you are ignoring more and more stuff, you're ignoring the details, but in order to ignore them correctly, you have to take into account what things they do in larger scales. So for the case of water, for example, the way the molecules are shaped, the way uh, their electric properties are, means that when you freeze water, it actually expands because it must have an hexagon-like pattern and stuff like that. And through these things, you get to, to lower energy theories. So you start with a high energy theory, you then drop details and account for the important details into parameters of your new theory, of your lower energy theory, and you get to a lower energy description. This is why you do the Sunner model to the Fermi model. This is what you do in principle. Uh, in principle, so idealistic, we don't actually do that because it's infinitely difficult for, for you to get from molecules to the ocean description and so on and so forth. That is essentially the idea that we use to get from GR to Newtonian gravity and from Newtonian gravity to the constant gravity uh, that we usually use when you're close to the Earth. So if you ever ask yourself, why exactly is Newton's law of gravity 1 over r squared? But when I'm doing calculations in my physics 101 course or something like that, why do I use constant gravity? And the reason for that, you can check by picking the Newtonian version, writing the distance, uh, that is the, the r squared in the denominator as being Earth radius plus h, where h is your height from the, the Earth's ground to whatever you are, and making a Taylor expansion in h, you are going to see that what happens is that you have very, very tiny corrections to the constant gravity field. And so it's simply easier to use the constant gravity field regardless of the details that could be added on. This is only going to change if you go to very high heights which is not what you usually do in physics 101, except if you're dealing with actual Newtonian gravity. And, well, uh, I talked a lot about these things, and now let me finally get to my point in here, which is, what is the renormalization group? The renormalization group is a technique, is a systematic way of doing this procedure of zooming out theories within quantum field theory and within statistical field theory. So it's what you do, you start with some high energy theory, and you can, the renormalization group tells you how to encode the details of this theory into a theory that should work in lower scales, in uh, higher spatial scales, lower energetic scales. So it takes our details and blurs them out in a way that you get a consistent theory at lower scales. It does not mean that you have a different theory in each scale. It actually just means that you're focusing on different details according to what exactly you're looking at. And you're just picking what is the right stuff to do, what is the exact stuff to do at a particular scale. And it is a really wonderful tool, it is really interesting. Uh, it is going to be exact if you're not doing it perturbatively or making approximations, but, and, well, essentially every scenario you must do some sort of approximation in order to solve the equations. But that is the main idea, it is a zoom out theory, it is a zoom out not a theory, a zoom out technique, a zoom out procedure that allows you to get from a very difficult theory that is has many, many details that can describe a lot of stuff to a simpler theory that you can use to describe what exactly you're interested in. So it makes things easier for you to calculate. Since physics is an experimental science and what really matters is the precision of your detector, the precision of your apparatus, how good it is going to measure, there is no point in using always a difficult theory, and it is interesting for you to use the simpler theory when you can, when it will not change the quality of your predictions according where the quality is thought of in terms of the precision of your apparatus, in terms of the precision of your measurement device. And that's one of the uses for the renormalization group. I've used it in my master's degree as a non perturbative tool, so if we could use these sorts of ideas to get non perturbative corrections to how a detector interacts with a quantum field. And 
that is a really interesting thing, but I think it's a better scene for another day. So I'll leave you here today, and thank you very much for your attention. Cheers.